And uh, we often hear some strange noises coming from the tracks. Usually they're in regard to maintenance activities. So back in March of 2020, right before the pandemic started to shut everything down, John and I both noticed these unusual noises coming from the direction of the tracks. And we got curious. So we put on our coats and walked down to the crossing to see what was going on. When we arrived, we saw a few Amtrak employees louder. We saw a few Amtrak employees there, along with an enormous piece of equipment on the rails, something we'd never seen before. We later found out that this piece of equipment is called a tamper, and its job is to, you can help me with this, Keith, sort of align the tracks and pack ballast, which is crushed stone, underneath the ties to level everything out. Well, while we were watching this activity, we noticed there was somebody else interested in what was going on, our friend here, Keith. Keith was busy recording this on, uh, on video. So we started chatting, introduced ourselves, and stood there together watching all this going on. A little later, I happened to notice a car parked nearby, which I assumed was Keith's car, and there was a woman in the car, and she'd been sitting there by herself all this time, so I went over to say hello to her. When I got closer to the car, I discovered, I know this woman. That's Sue from the Mystic YMCA. Of course, I never knew her last name, so now I could put two and two together and get the two halves here to Mr. and Mrs. Keith Barker. After, uh, after a while, I think we were all getting a little chilly, and so I invited Keith and Sue back to our house for a hot cup of tea and a biscuit. And while we sat in the dining room chatting, we learned about Keith and Sue's backgrounds, their earlier lives in England, um, Keith's professional life, and the fact that he had just recently become a history buff on the rail lines in southeastern Connecticut, and that he was making this series of videos to capture the history for us. Now, fast forward to exactly this week last year, 2022. Some of you may have been here for Stuart's, Stuart Weiss's presentation on his book, Stonington's Steamboat Hotel. How many were here for that? Well, when the presentation was over, I overheard some people who were near me talking about how they wished they knew more about the trains of Stonington over the years. And I thought, wow, that'd be a great topic for another SFL presentation. And I know the perfect person to give us that presentation. So I ran it by Carla, who got approval from the presentation committee. And we got Keith on board, haha, with the idea. And so here we are. So you may have seen in the uh, program flyer a little bit about Keith's background. Keith has been in higher education for over 50 years, including 18 years teaching electrical engineering at the University of Sheffield in England. And he taught another 36 years at the University of Connecticut in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. So I'm very pleased to present to you Dr. Keith Barker. Please welcome him. Oh, I didn't, I didn't wait for the train or something. Sorry, that's all right. <laughs> Well, um, I'm very <laughs> pleased to be here, I'm a little overawed. Um, I, I'm, I'm used to teaching 400 students at a time, but this is, uh, this is a rather different occasion, and I'm very happy to be here. I told uh, Rory she wasn't allowed to speak for the first 16 seconds.
So things don't always work out uh, that you want. But uh, so I thought we needed a little bit of sound and not only pictures and, and me. So that's what I started to do. So I'll give you a little bit more, more of that background and then I'll tell you a little bit how we, we a little bit more of, of what we did when we met. So I, I was born in a, a very small village in England, in Yorkshire, in fact, called Cottingham. And uh, th this is our railway station. You can see it's not a very busy railway station there. And uh, the problem I had then was that I, I, I went, this is the school I went to. And you've got to take a note of the date on this. <laughs> this, this. <laughs> I wasn't, that wasn't me. I mean, th this was in Beverly, and this, this school is the oldest grammar school in England. So I was, I didn't know that until I left. <laughs> but that's where I was, and, and I, I spent uh, several years there. So just, just to give you a picture of where we are in, uh, in terms of geography, um, Beverly is up in the northeast corner, corner of England. And the problem I had was I didn't have the funding or my parents chose not to give me the funding to do the traveling that some of my friends were doing to go to the major hubs. And they were, as you can see here, York and Doncaster and Crewe. They were major places where you could get um, some good views and, and collect train numbers. And I'm getting an indication, and my ears are a problem. A little louder, okay. <laughs> So that's, that's sort of my background is that I don't have the same background as many others and probably many of you here. So what I did when I came here, I decided I could limit what I, what I was interested in. And so I, I started at Westerly. I thought, well, that's the point at which trains come into Connecticut. That would be a good point to start. And so that's what I did. And so w w the first part of my talk is really about this, this part of the state and what I found that uh, I, I tell you now, I have deliberately avoided the trolleys. <laughs> there are people here who are far better to talk about the trolleys than me. And, uh, and I decided I'd got to limit what I was interested in and, and as I developed the stories and started to build the, the video. Train approaching. Please remain behind yellow line. Okay, and sit down. It's, it's, it's the important thing about that. So, so I started at Westerly. And as you, as you all know, this is a... Was, was rebuilt, I think it was in 1912, uh, a very, very nice station, particularly in this particular area. In fact, in Connecticut, there are not very many nice stations, but this is particularly one of them. And, and it's, it's been increased in its technology because when I first came here, there was, for, for the handicap, you had to get into a, a, a little cart and that took you up and down the, uh, the tracks on each side. But now we have an elevator there. So at least we've got a little bit of, of improvement through uh, through the time I've been here and I said this that's in, in Westerly. So Westerly of course is one of the places where the trains actually stop. Um, you know, the, <laughs> the problem with Connecticut trains don't stop at the stations they go straight through and and I live in, in Palmer's Cove there and it's a lot of trains on a daily basis but none of them are stopping or a few of them are stopping at New London now. So this is what I could see is there the regional stop, stop there and then the problem was that places like Pawtucket, um, we've got the crossings. And so I'll only come back to those crossings in a little while. But they seem to be particularly, I've seen them on the West Coast and that they're very prevalent there. But here in Connecticut, we still have this problem of the tracks have to follow the, the flat, flat, flatness of the state and it's already down the, down the coast. So Pawtucket, we have that. And so it means that when, when we've got the, the trains traveling through Pawkatuck, there's a lot of dead ends. And what I found in, in the state is there are, there are a lot of dead ends of track. Every, almost every town you go to, there's, a, there's a, a, a track that goes off and goes nowhere. So this is one of the dead ends because um, people are not allowed there. They've, so they built the roads right up to the, state, the train themselves. And those of you at this area will recognize this corner here. Um, it, it's a great pity, but it does mean that at least we can we, we can find out we can get close to the stage trains at times. And one of the things about Pawtucket, Pawtucket, as I've found, is that this is Mechanic Street, which you'll recognise if you live around here. Mechanic Street has 
an interesting hill at the end of it. And this hill is, goes down to the river on the back of all the industrial sites there. And it was there for, for a train track. Because if you, if you go further across, you'll see the abutments that are across Mechanic Street, which is where the train went across. And the train went across there and round the back. That, it, it, it would actually join the main line at this point. Um, they don't, they've never cleaned it up as far as I can tell. It's still in this rough position. But that's the main line going round the back. And that heap, that, that hill and that abutment showed where the train actually ran from the road, took, took goods from the, from the river down into the main line and the other side of the river here. So, so what I did then was I said, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to work westwards. So I've got, I'm, I'm done a west, west, westerly. Let's have a look, see what we've got in, in Stonington. And this is what happened in Stonington. Well, as I said, many of you have lived through this will, will certainly know the story that this is where the bridge, the, the railway used to be. It, it's very clear if you look on the maps, th this, is, this is the point at which the rails used to go across Stonington. It's now been shifted across here, and so we've got the main line there. This, this is the road that was the main line for the railway. Well, it doesn't go anywhere now because they built a house down at the end of it. But they were happy about that. So, uh, so that's, that's what happened, you know, they moved the railway, and part of the problem with the railways was that, well, first of all, uh, people didn't like it when they started to build them. They were, they were noisy, um, particularly those involved in the churches. Didn't, li didn't like the noise of the trains. So I, what I gather they did was they then stopped the trains going and they put horses on the front of the, the trains and, and clip-clap cl those through. That didn't so solve the problem either. It was still noisy. So... We abandoned that in the end, as I, as I understand it anyway. But this is where the track went, right down Denison Avenue. And it went right across, across the, the town itself and ended up in, in Matthews Park, which those of you who know Stonington will know that's down at the end. And that was the, sort of the last point before it went onto the ships, because the port was down there. So, so Matthews Park was there. Now, before you get to Matthews Park, you, you recognize the, the church, the Catholic the, the church, and here is a, is a plaque, which m most people in this area know about, but that's just for your benefit. It's, it's to point out the fact that this was where our, our friend um, George Washington started to bring in the first trains into, into Stonington. And, and this, and this, he's, he's buried in the cemetery down the road here. And, and then, of course, you probably know that he also his family lived here for a while. And, and, and this, he, he, was the, he, he was not Whistler's mother. He was the wife of Whistler's mother because it was his son that painted the picture. And, and so that was, that, that, they're, they're, they're here now. What I, what I thought about this, you know, they were worried about the noise of the trains I wondered what they would think about this. I think they would, <laughs> they would have gone somewhere else to church when they heard that sort of noise. Anyway, we're back to where Rory was talking about. This is the, the entrance to Iliu Island. This is the, the, the causeway that goes across to Iliu Island. And the problem is, as you probably were in, in the... In, in, the, in the documents that are around now, how do we get a, away from all these at-grade crossings? We have 11 at-grade crossings between here um, at Porkatuck and Minor Lane in, on the west side of uh, New London. So we have 11. And as I said, you can't do much about them when they're on the flat because they're against the water in many cases. So how, we can either go over or we can go under. And neither of those things is very easy. So next, next to the Elio Island crossing is this one that goes to Walker's Dock. So this is, I think, probably one of those that, that, that we could do something about by, by moving the roads on that side so that it's one, one road and then one crossing at, on the, uh, over the railway. But I don't know what will happen, but I think that's, looking at the plans, 
that seems to be to be one of the easiest things to do in terms of trying to reduce the at grade crossings. But there's 11 of them, and it's going to be a major problem to to go around that. So back to Rory's story now. This this is this is in Lucerne. No, it's Interlaken in Switzerland. Now you notice these guys here. These guys are doing what that piece of equipment that Toy described was doing. So that, that it's it's an interesting piece of equipment. You'll notice that on the on the left hand side here, there's a wheel which is actually holding the track up. Well, and while while those are held up, then they the ballast is then disturbed and, and shifted about by these devices, which then you'll see drop down. So it's just an interesting comparison to watch the people in Interlaken <laughs> they do this job by hand. They've got a little bit of equipment there, but they were doing that. And I thought, well, that's exactly what Rory and John and I were watching when we were down at Ilio Island. Now, one of the other things that's happened since I've been here in, in the States is that at Dod Don's Dock, and, and those of you who were around here will know that that bridge was actually changed in format, uh, partly to, to lift it so that we could get some boats underneath. But um, it, it was done very professionally. And, and, and this is the diagram that's out of the, uh, the company's uh, video. What they did was they built a second section of the road that they want to replace alongside of it. And so, this was built alongside, and then when they wanted to move it over, they shifted the whole thing over to that side. And then at one night, they replaced that whole section of the track and, and all its connections. A remarkable piece of engineering. If you want to look at the details, if you go to the, the site of Majeski and Masters, it's, I've, I've stolen these pieces off, off them, don't tell them. Uh, but if you... Uh, if you look at their site, you'll find the details of that. And I think it's an amazing piece of engineering. As, as Rory said, I'm an engineer by background. And so looking at this, I thought that, that really was an amazing piece of work they did. So you can find that, as I said, on, online. So if we may keep moving west, we come to Mystic. And here we have the, the Mystic station, which again, is not used very much, but it, there are trains that stop there, and uh, and you can get a cup of coffee there. Uh, well, in 1938, 30, it uh, it had a, in a mishap, and uh, so what happened after that point was that the community got together and said, "We want to build a station back." So in in these last 20 years, they've rebuilt the station, so it's now fully operational and a very nice place to be. But we do have two other stations close to Mystic. This is West Mystic. Now, West Mystic was, it is questionable as to West, whether West Mystic was, was in that position uh, after the this, this, this storm. Some people tell me it was, it was shifted by 90 degrees. Some people tell, it, tell me it was the storm that shifted it by 90 degrees. I find that a little difficult to believe, but that's what they tell me. And so that's there. And it's actually sitting on School Street. This is School Street in Mystic, and, and that's where the railway that where the railway station is. We have a, we have an almost identical one in no, oh, so there's the picture of, of where it would have been in its in its orientation along the tracks, which makes a lot of sense rather than at right, right angles, which is where it is now. So the other one we have is at Noank, and, th and this is an identical station. But again, that this is along the length of the track, so it's in the right orientation and uh, is now used by one of the yacht club uh, offices. But it's interesting, and, and you can see the, the symbol up here is, is typical of several stations around here uh, that I keep finding that that, that, that company that built them to identify them with that particular symbol. So, Mystic River. The interesting thing about the Mystic River Bridge is that it sits here, down uh, on, the, on this particular diagram, but there's a second bridge, and that's the one at the top here, 
which is, uh, which is um, the Bascule Bridge up there. The reason I introduced that, which of course is a roll, red roll bridge, road bridge, is that boats coming down the river would like not to have to wait two hours, one hour for one bridge and then one hour for the other bridge. So they're synchronized loosely so that boats can travel from one to the other uh, without stopping. Now, obviously, the railway takes some precedent down here, but uh, from what I've seen, um, people seem to be reasonably happy about that. And I think, again, this is one of the things which the community would have set up to make sure that it works for everybody and, and works for the, both the, the boaters and for the people on the rail. Now, as I said, I, I live in, in Palmer's Cove, uh, and this, this was... <laughs> This is when I first, before I made, no, this was when I first moved there. It, we, we didn't have the electric lines. We, uh, we spent some nights in the summer keeping the windows closed because they were hammering and putting in the concrete pillars then uh, to, put, to put in the electric lines. They, they did give us the option of going to the Hilton one night, which we took. <laughs> so that was a, a relief one night for that. So Palmer's Cove is like that. Now, of course, we've got the electric lines now. These electric lines are at uh, 25 kilovolts per line. So we have two 25 kilovolt lines. Now this is what's called a parallelist, a parallelist station. And it's not an obvious thing for people to understand what goes on here. But there is, there are these are every six miles along the track, along the electrified track. And what they do in general is to make sure that if one of the one of the lines goes down then they're able to switch the power back onto the second line to make sure that trains keep going and so that there, in this particular place here there, there are two 25 kv lines uh, one on one on each side of this and they're able to switch then the power to the lines on on the track to keep it going you have one here in stonington you can see it says Stonington there. Um, I don't know exactly where it is, <laughs> but I will find it before it time to talk again about this. And, uh, but that, those, that's what they're there for. So they're there for safe, safety, and, but also to maintain the services on, on the railways if, if any of the power goes down. So you've got 25 kV on both. So you've got 55 kV, 50 kV across the, these lines uh, that, are, that are up here. So, so the trains around the back of my house now are these, and they're, they're, much, they're much noisier. Now this, this I found when I was doing the research about this area. This is a very interesting area. Because this is where, where for, you can see this is the airport, where Groton Airport is. And this end here is where the state park is, where, where um, the Bluff Point State Park is. So this was this this was this the the marshalling yard that was put in where the Bluff Point is now, and that was built in, in operation between uh, 1902 and 1929. It was a it was a major connection point between the west and the north up up from New York to uh, Boston. It it had miles and miles and miles of track. And could hold many, many uh, uh, wagons and railways. And the the, the fact that it failed in 1929 is because the engines were getting too big, and they couldn't they couldn't actually deal with them. They couldn't they couldn't they had places to put them. So this thing sort of failed at that point. Uh, but you can see it was just it's just immense. And if you think that what is now there is just trees and footpaths. This was there in the early 1900s. And so what I thought I'd do is, is I'd put this on a, a map so you could see exactly what it was. So here, here is the, the east end uh, with its own signal box, and I'll show you that in a minute. And then at the far end, there's another signal box up there. And here we've got, we've got a, 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 a turntable. I'm sorry, I can't see where that lies. <laughs> because there's a turntable. And so you got a, a track that would come along here and then go, and those of you who've been on Bluff Point will remember that there's this footpath. And this goes over to where the airport is, but there's a break in it here. 
And that was originally one of the tracks that went across the area which is now the airport. And, and when it was before an airport, it, it was part of the military, the military used it, the state used it, and then it became part of the airport. Once it became the airport, then that was useless for the trains. So the trains then went along the top, top line, the, the diagram I've just shown you. So there is a superimposed picture of the, 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 the tracking that was underneath there. So this is, this is the main line going there. This is the round table uh, and the engine sheds were down here. And then the other, the other line went this the way and then across um, and then to where the, where, the, um, where the airport is now. So it's, uh, I think it's an interesting look of, at how that fitted exactly with what we have there. You can still see pieces of this round table are still there, uh, not very obvious and certainly a little dangerous at times. So at one end of the, uh, on the right of that area, we've got Tower 121. We call them signal boxes in England. It seems to make more sense, but then uh, we don't always make more sense in England. Uh, but the 121 is up there, and at the other end, you've got 120. So I've been looking to see where all these signal boxes are. And we've now found 120 and 121. I know where they were. And this is about in 1905, I think. But what, one of the things that they did at this, um, this the big area at Brook Point was to do not just maintenance of the tracks, but to do physical support for, the, um, for, the, for commerce. So what, what they would find, this, this is a refrigerated vehicle, by the way. So what they did was they brought in ice from uh, New York and, and I think from Pennsylvania in huge blocks and put, it, put them in these coaches, in these wagons. And this, this is for oranges, by the way, and then shipped them over to Boston. So you've got fresh fruit, but it's, it's down in, in New York area, shipped to Boston on these refrigerated uh, wagons that are filled with, with ice. My, my dad was in the fruit trade in, a long time ago, and in fact, they were still doing that, bringing in fruit in from Europe, from Italy. Uh, with wag with uh, with ice ice in the ends of the wagons, so it wasn't a new idea, but clearly this is this is one of the things that was great greatly ad ad advantageous for people wanting to get fruit, fresh fruit in Boston or in from New York. So Tower One Nineteen is underneath the big bridge, underneath the the shall we call it Thames River for the time being. Um, <laughs> And so that's in, in reasonably good nick, you can't get into it, but the interesting thing then was, and I have some, I have, I found that I have some friends in, in New Haven with a, who are very knowledgeable in a lot of these things that I don't know anything about. And I've been working with them to try and find out sometimes the bits are missing. Well, I can't find, and he, my friend over there couldn't, couldn't, could definitively say that 118 was here, but we think it was this cabin that was on, on, on the bridge itself, because we can't find a 118 anywhere else. Because once you get on the other side of the, the river, the numbers follow on, but I don't know. So 119 is, is about here, and you can see those arrows sort of indicate where the, tr where the trains would go from that particular point. So we, we're coming in from, uh, from, the, from the, this side, We've got a bridge over here, which was built in 1889, which really was the, was the opening of um, moving the rest of Connecticut, and in fact, the rest of the, west of the rest of the country back into Connecticut and the Northeast here. So here, here's the bridge, and you can see here, there's, there's a, um, it's a, it's a bascule bridge, the weight's there, and, it, and here's, the, here's the, the, uh, the control, I think, so we think that that was, that was actually the number 118 uh, along that track. So that was, uh, as I said, it was the Bascule Bridge. The, the weight, unlike the Bascule Bridge that we have for the road in Mystic, which has the weights above the, the bridge, this has the weights below. And I'll show you another example in a little while. So what we have now is a, is a bridge. This, as I remember, uh, it gives us a height of 50 feet, 
to allow the boats to get in uh, underneath and, and up the river. But that is a problem. You know, boats are of width, and you know far better than I do. They're wide and they're tall. And if the bridges don't work, then they can, the people complain. I'll show you another example in a minute. Now, you'll recognize this because this is New London Station. But my question is, do you know why it's called a Union Station? And you don't have to answer that. Imagine I asked you that question. Why is it called a Union Station? All, all the stations in the country where they were a joint, jointly used by two different rail systems were called Union Stations. And so we have we have a train system going up the east coast of the river, one going up the west coast of the river, and the fact that they joined here meant that this was called the Union Station. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called the Union Station. So, as you will recognize, it's, it's a very nice station, in fact. Uh, it was, when I said it was, I forget it was started, it was rebuilt several times. And, and you'll notice there are no supports for the second floor. It's all hung from the floor above to give you a nice open space into that area here. The interesting thing I found was that if you're walking down the, the track or you're on here, you'll, you'll see this, this curved bit of grass work. That was the original ticket office for the Union Station. Uh, now it isn't used as a ticket office, they're obviously inside, but it, that is the only curved piece of the station other than the, the entrance arch on the front of it. Everything else is rectangular, except for that and, the, and that box there. So that takes us to the station. Well, where do we go from there? Well, we can go up the east side of the river, um, and you, you'll recognize this is where the, the submarine is. Um, the P&B, Providence and B, B and P and B. The, the Providence and Boston uh, Railway went up the east coast, and it was very popular in the early 1900s because, because of the, the boat race that, uh, that was here between Yale and Harvard. Uh, it, you, know, the, you know, there are only, <laughs> there's so much athletic, athleticism and athletic activities in this country that I get confused. However, in England, there are only two, there are, there are only two occasions when two universities compete. Oxford and Cambridge compete with a, a rugby match and with a boat race. That's the only thing that happens in, in the British athletic system in the universities. But this is the, the Yale and Harvard boat race, which was held on the river. And these, these trains were then filled with people who could then follow the track, uh, follow the boat as it went up. Or they could go into these specially built um, places down the side to see what was going on. So it, was, it seemed to me to be a very, very popular occasion for people to go and, and spend time looking at these. Of course, it depended on who won as to who painted the rock. Uh, I guess it was Yale then. It was uh, Yale on that particular occasion because you see all the students at that point. Now, this is a very interesting thing I found. I'd be surprised to know if anybody knows where that is. It's, it's, in, it's an Allen Point. It's actually in the Dow Chemical buildings. And it, it's, it, I was very fortunate in being able to find out where it was and, and shown around it. But that, that is the cemetery that was put there um, to, to, to house uh, the Allen family as, as they were buried. And uh, on this particular occasion, 1781, those of you who are historians will know what happened then. But three Allens were, were killed, and they're buried in this cemetery here in, the, in this area. It, it's not publicly available. I was privileged to be taken round it a, a year or two back. Um, but it, I think they opened it a sort of couple of years, sorry, a couple of times a year for invited people to go and see it. So it's another piece of history which, you know, when I, as I said, I'm not a historian, but I find all these things which are interesting. So I, I, was, I went up the, the west coast of the river, east coast of the river, to Norwich, or Norwich, let's get it right. Uh, and 
And this building, this is the station. It's now part of the Norwich uh, magazine, now the bulletin. And they, they have at least maintained the inside box, uh, at the, the ticket office, which is really nice. And so um, I was working with the, the people here to try and find out a little bit more about it. Um, but I was also trying to find out if I could get some pictures of freight trains, because there are not many freight trains in this country, and they always seem to come past when I get to bed at about quarter to 11. <laughs> so I don't get a chance to see the freight trains much. So, so what I did was I, I, made, I made a contact with somebody at Plainfield, and then that's where the freight train starts and goes to the Dow Chemicals, sort of on a daily basis. So I was out there, and I was with the people from the, from the newspaper, and my friend called me and said, there's a train coming. So that was great. I'd seen the a freight train. We call them goods trains in England, by the way, just to add a translation into that. So the freight train was there. And the, the, the nice thing was they said to me, well, we, we're going to write a little bit about you in the, in the magazine, in the paper. So I went the following day and had a look at the paper. I, have the front pa I was on the front page <laughs> of, the, of the Norwich Bulletin because of this train here. So... So I'm working my way west again. This is, uh, I didn't know East London existed for, for a place. And uh, as people I've talked to don't realize there is a place called East London, but there is. And uh, this is um, literally in the, on the east side of the, the bridge. So you come underneath the bridge and it's, uh, it says NEC. It, it gives you the name of the, the railway system. This, uh, according to a picture that was taken by the photographer on the day, uh, at the day, is where there's some development work going by the the local um, Indian population. But I found this was interesting as well, that we've got this charging station there just in East London. It's it's being powered by wind, which I thought was neat. And then you can, you can unplug in to, to that. So that's a, an, an interesting little piece that developed from the railways. Up up the west coast of the river, river there, are, there are lots of flagstops places. There's no businesses down there at all. Um, so Harrison's is one of, one, of the, one of them. There's a very nice uh, trestle at Smith Cove, a very substantial one uh, there, which because the, the trains used to go across that. At Montville, um, the, the trains go round the back of there. But again, there's another, tress, the, there's another trestle there. So, I, you know, the trestles are hidden. So those sort of things which you really want to find something interesting about, you've got to scrabble around. I, 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 at the end of my videos, I always thank my wife for, for finding, for coming with me for all this, all this brush and everything that we scrabble through to find to get these pictures. But this, this I came across, which I thought was interesting. And this was a training station up between, um, up in that, in that part of the area. The, the river is on the west-hand side here uh, and on the right-hand side. And so this was a, it, it looked at the moment like a, a summer camp. You may know better than I do, but it looks like a summer camp there. And so there was, it was used as a training camp right in the middle of, the, uh, of, of those two stations up on the coast there. So I, I, I finished when I got to Yantic. I thought, I'm going no further. <laughs> I'm going to, also going to get stuck up in Worcester or somewhere like that. So I stopped in Yantic and then went down and looked at on the, on the other side of the river. Which, I, which I'd ever uh, I'd done, but I was interested now in, in what went out in the bottom left-hand corner, because as you know, we've now got not only the the regional camp uh, regional trains, but we've got the new electric trains, and those are very quiet, and they're running off the same lines. So we've got a 25 kV line, which they're picking up on and running those trains from New London to Old Saybrook, if I remember. So I. Uh, I took my granddaughters on that. They were, they were quite chuffed, as we say in England, to be on the new, new trains because they're really nice. They're, 
very clean. They'd only been in operation for a couple of weeks. But then I started to look at further over to the other side of the river. And I found this point here, which is Route 213. And here, there was another railway station. And most people, not, not it, <laughs> that it, people worked there don't know about it. And I got, got hold of John, uh, what's his name, the, the oil company that's there. Um, somebody remember what his name is? Hendel, thank you. Yeah. I, I talked to John Hendel about this, and he didn't know it was, because I wanted permission to go around and take some pictures. And he said, fine, not a, not a problem, go ahead. Uh, he didn't know there was a railway station there, but it, this is another one of the dead ends. You, well, you can see this is a brown track. It's not a heavily used track. Uh, and so it's not, and one of these dead ends that I keep coming across um, that are not used anymore. But this was a very interesting station here. Yeah. Did they? Well, bring it in. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, J John, John was uh, somewhat knowledgeable, but not completely knowledgeable about, about what his company was doing. But I don't say that loudly. Um, so I, I then looked at what's going to happen when we go west here. And, and uh, I, was, I was at Waterford Library, and they'd, they'd come across a book, a, a handwritten book by a man, this was written about the 1920s, and it's fascinating. It's all written in, in prose of, of his personal view and, and, and what he saw in, in that period of time. If you ever get the chance to go to Waterford Library, um, it, it, but ask to borrow it. Ask Linda if you can borrow it. it. It was fascinating. She wouldn't let it out of the library, but she at least let me go in and read it. And so you can see from there, uh, there's millstone over the back there. But that, light, that station provided access by people in Connecticut to go down to the beach. So this was a point at which they would come in on the trains and they'd get on the buses or whatever they were provided with and go down to the beach, to the Pleasure Beach. And this, this church in New, London, in, uh, New York was built with, or partially built with granite that was shipped from that particular station. And again, you know, it's, it's all this detailed stuff that was in this personal document that I found fascinating that we could do that. It did, not all the, not all the, all the, uh, um, the, 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 the stone came from here, but a fairly significant part of it. In fact, I haven't got a picture of the top, but if you look at that picture of that church, it isn't completely finished. That one of the towers was never, never finished. It was left as it, as it was. So if we keep moving west, we come to Niantic, and Niantic now is this very nice grassy area where their station used to be, and that was at the bottom of Pennsylvania Avenue. And you go down Pennsylvania Avenue, and you see this beautiful place there. Well, that was the station. It was a, a great pity, really, because it was a very nice station they, they got uh, in that area. And the problem with the Niantic was people complained, the, ship, the shippers, the, sorry, the ship users complained that the bridge wasn't wide enough and wasn't tall enough. They couldn't get through. So this was back in 1907. In 2012, they built a new, a new bridge. So that's much taller, much wider, and the shippers are now happy. And this is another bascule bridge. It's, it's here. You can see it's, it. Where is the weight? Where well, the weight is on the back, or it's underneath. So you can see the bascule bridges have not all got the weight at the top, but some of them have got the weight at the bottom. And this one has got it weight at the bottom. And this is now very heavily used. And people can get now down to Crescent Beach. All the way along this coast, the railway goes along and you can drop off and you find all the dead ends. But then you find that there's all the villages along there. And they seem to be very popular, particularly on the beaches. And then right at the end, just before you get to the the river, the river, the Connecticut River, we hit South Lime Station. Now, the interesting about South Lime Station, it says it's still here.
particularly from the northeast now, we need to get more stations that will allow people to use the trains rather than you know, to drive 50 miles to the nearest one. Because between here and Boston, there's not many, and certainly between here and New York, there's a few more. But you can you can get a fair amount of distance there. But I think you've got to look, we've got to look at the infrastructure in a, in, in a broad way to, before you can get a lot more uh, activities going. Well, maybe it's not on the top of you. We're talking about the belt, the local railroad line here, but you know these um, derailments. Yeah. Like you had up in Awful, yeah. East Palestine, and then there was three or four others. And what causes these? Is it shifting due to the weather, cold or hot, that causes misalignment that would lead to a derailment in the first place? My, my, it's, it's my, very my, disconcerting. My sort of sense is it's it's maintenance. It's a maintenance issue. That you know, all, all, well, if you've ever stood and watched the the, the, the tracks move, you you get the clunk and you get the electromagnetic forces switch the thing. And if they're not complete, or if there's ice between them, they don't complete the, the track. So, and I think um, what I sense is that there's not enough maintenance done on the tracks themselves. And, I, and I've watched a lot in England as well. We don't get the weather that you get here, fortunately. But uh, I think a lot of them is to do with switching and detecting. And we have to the, 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 the people who control the switches have nowhere near where the switch is. They're tens of miles away in some cases. And so I think, you know, we've got to have you know, the, all the mimic diagrams and everything else have got to be really accurately displaying what's going on. And the people who are actually doing the switching have got to have the sense and the, 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 the background to be able to do things right. So I think there's, there's a lot of little things going on. With, you know, we've had these direct, dreadful things in in the, in the, in the, in the occurrences the last few weeks. Do you want to say something more about me? Yeah. <laughs> do you have a picture of the Stonington Station, Keith? Do I have a picture of the Stonington Station? We do. Well, if you've got it, send it to me. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, you know, I, I hunt around a lot of things to try and find pictures, and, and they're really good, and I, you know, I steal them from other people as well, I try to make sure that they give them credit for them, and so the longer versions of this are on video, and in this, there's five sections at the moment, I'm just working on the sixth section now, uh, well it was before I came here, because I, I find it fascinating, uh, and as I said, I'm not a historian, but I, and my, although Rory didn't tell you, I failed history twice <laughs> 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 when I was at the grammar school. It just was not in, not in interesting to me at all. Yeah. When I was a boy, I grew up near Midway. Yeah. And there were still hobos there. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it's. I think it's a it's a fascinating thing around our area. A lot of people have no idea what the point was like. And you know, if we if we start to expand that, we know what the, the people who own the land were got all sorts of cottages down on the water and things like that. And the thing that you, if you, I didn't explain it in the diagram there, but the reason that the trains go down one side and the other side is that there's a huge block of, of, of uh, stone in the middle. So that's why it's split, split out. It's not, it just makes no sense. Why, why wouldn't they, they wouldn't they all go in the same place? They can't. There's not the space. And you can go, I've, I've been in there, the, um, the, ice, um, the ice shed, or the ice building, is, the foundations are still there. And it's huge. You, want, you can wander, walk around them. They're, they're, it's a huge foundation there. Big blocks of stone with all the metal connectors that would hold the structure above them. So the evidence is there. And, it, and it's, it, I find it ins inspiring to think that that's what they did. It's unfortunate the engines got too big, they couldn't deal with them, and um, and they just had to, they came up with alternatives, and so 1929 was the end. Part of the problem was that that, that was a service facility at Midway. I'm a bit of a railroad buff, but Good. That, was a, that was a service facility for steam engines, but they started, on the shoreline, they started switching away from steam engines earlier, so they, yeah. they didn't need to stop Midway between Boston and New York. Yeah. So they shifted away from it. It lost its, it's, lost its reason for existing. Well, people often say, what, why, why do you call it Midway? And I say, it's Midway between Boston and New York. 
Um, in fact, they, they built um, accommodation for the workers. And in fact, they had to, expand, had to expand that accommodation because they were, they were sort of running at least two shifts in every bed um, because they couldn't get enough people to be working on it. It was a tremendous operation there. I, I wish I had some really good pictures, but I'd, I'd, my, my friend in the, the Noank Library had, a, had an album, album which I borrowed to get those pictures. But, but I'm sure there's some better ones around that I don't have. Yeah, you. As I understand it, the reason there was a station in Westminster is that there was a casino on Willow Point. Yeah. And uh, it was very popular. It had live music and dancing. And, uh, people would take the train um, to uh, go for Saturday night at the casino on Willow Point. And the trolleys would go up to that. Yeah. So. If anybody knows Bob Sukich, he, he's, he's one of the people who sort of encouraged me to do this. And I, take, I give him a lot of credit for enthusing me. And so, yeah, he's told me a lot about the, the casinos and the, and the way that the, the trolleys used to, to go. And, and, and where the trolleys came off the track, and near da Don's Dock, there's a, there's a left-hand bend where the trolleys used to go down. And one of them went straight through there and, and into the water. But yes, a lot of these stories, he's a fascinating man to talk to. When there was a flood that came through this old mystic, it washed the road away, and there were rail, there were trolley tracks under the road. Yeah. The well, there still are on, on mystic itself. If you if you go if you go through the so on on the west side of the of the bridge, there's still the, the gaps are in the road where you can see see where the trolleys are. The trolley lines are still there. Someday they'll dig them up. If you're, if you're interested in Connecticut railroad stations, there's a there's a website called Tyler City Station yeah. that our friend Bob Bolesky does. You know, I have pictures of pretty much every station that ever yeah. existed in the locations of Connecticut. He's, I, like, I have a, he's list. a retired research librarian, so he does an <laughs> awesome job of putting the history out there. And he keeps a free and click. And he keeps it up to date as well. He does. Yeah, I have a list now of my section six now, which is going from where I am now to New 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 Haven. And so I have a list of all the pages in his, uh, his site there to go to. He's very good, very good. I'm, I'm curious, have you um, had a chance to look at the, what's called the Groton Secondary at all? Secondary what? Well, there's a loop <laughs> that goes, um, comes down the um, uh, east uh, side of the Thames River, right. runs parallel to the NEC, and then loops around at the top. Uh, to uh, between Electric Boat and Pfizer. Have you looked at that at all? I've, Pfizer are a bit wary about uh, collecting information down there. I've <laughs> tried, I, have some, I have some pictures of some of the rolling stock that they've, they, 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 they used to use and would moved elsewhere because they didn't need it. But there's an, uh, down by the, um, the, the airport track, there's a, an extra line that goes around the one that was forced around the back and actually goes through the um, the golf course yes. and down down to Pfizer. So I've, I'm one of my basic principles is that I will not tread on other people's toes. So I, I'm be very I'm very careful. I ask permission and I try to recognise people that are going to help me because it's very important and because it means I can go again. Yeah. That, that line was the original main line, and car ferries, you, they would put the passenger before they built the Thames River Bridge, they would yeah. put the cars across between London and Groton on that line. Yeah, I went right to the ferry. In fact, one thing I didn't mention that I, I, I should have done is that the, the uh, coast, e east coast track, that the, the, new, the, 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 new, uh, the new one that we've got, oh, it's been running, but with the new trains on it, the first the first uh, ferry that, w that was built to allow uh, carriages, uh, wagons to go on it had, this, had that name. So it was Shoreline East, I think, or Shoreline something or other. So the, the name has been maintained from the first mm -hmm. boat that was built in, uh, at the shipyards down, down the coast here. And um, so you know, the, the, it, in Greenman Bill, there are three, the three Greenman brothers they, they, they started that, and it was one of them that built that first boat that carried a single wagon across the, the coast, across the river, 
and then when it was successful then they built another one which I think would take three three wagons and that was the beginning of the, the need for transportation across that river and then you had to look to, look to the bridges after that so thank you there's still some remnants foundation remnants of the Stonington train station that's um, along the tracks where Dodson Boatyard is between the entrance to the Watamana Club and the viaduct. Yeah, I, I, don't I remember know. as a child seeing yeah. seeing the train go by and seeing the station. I'm really happy <coughs> people tell me things because uh, you know as I get older, like we all do, I don't know whether I lose it, another percentage of my memory, memory every year, but I, I, I'm very happy for people to say, hey KB, you've forgotten about this. I'll write it down and then add it in. But it, it's great to share, and I, and I appreciate you all coming. Really do. Are there any train derailments?